Welcome to Introduction to Machine Learning. This lecture is a, an example and the idea is that we will go through a very simple example using all of the topics that we've discussed so far and uh, take a little bit of a look at the sort of results one can expect and also the uh, code that's necessary to get it to work. So this is a, a data set that comes from Kaggle. Kaggle is a, a Google-owned company that uh, organizes machine learning competitions. You can go to Kaggle and download uh, data for a range of different uh, uh, domains. In this case, this is uh, house prices. Uh, Kaggle also keeps uh, data sets in escrow so that one can compare the results of your own machine learning algorithm against uh, 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 validation set which you've not seen before and other people haven't seen before. Uh, and it also keeps track of other people's performance on particular data sets. So it's a worthwhile place to go to get experience with uh, trying machine learning in a variety of domains. Uh, this is a, a data set that consists of um, prices and features for 1,456 homes in Ames, Iowa. And those were homes that were sold between 2006 and 2010. And um, here our goal is going to be to try to use the features of the houses in order to predict the price. And we're going to focus on predicting the log of the price because the prices, relative price is uh, much more important than absolute price. And house prices typically vary over a significant range. Uh, so our performance metric is going to be the RMS error on the test set of the log of the house price. Uh, in particular, if you have a, an RMS error of say 0.1, then it means that you can predict house prices within a factor of e to the 0.1, which is about 10.5%. Here's the sort of thing one sees in this data. Here we have a plot of the target variable, which is the log of the price, against one of the uh, independent variables, the uh, living area of the house in this case. And you can see, well, first of all, there's uh, uh, quite a lot of variation, just knowing the living area doesn't narrow down the price very much. Um, uh, here we've got uh, house prices varying between e to the 10 and a half and e to the 13 or e to the 14, um, uh, which is um, uh, must be less than 100,000 to more than 500,000. And uh, so we're seeing quite a, quite a variation here. Now the data set actually contains some 80 features. We're going to use uh, maybe uh, the first um, 20 features and uh, uh, focus on, uh, on those. Uh, so for our embedding, uh, for embedding the uh, target variable, we're going to let V be the price and Y be the log of V, it's the log of the price. And then for the independent variables x, we're going to uh, embed them as follows. We have uh, some of those fields of a house record are numerical. And we, those we can just embed unchanged. So in particular, we have the year the house was built, the area of the living space, the area of the first floor, the area of the second floor, the area of the garage, the area of the wooden deck, the area of the basement, the year of the last remodel and the area of the lot. So all of the areas are in square feet, they're just numbers, and the years are simply years, they're just integers. And we will just embed those as numbers as they are. There are also ordinal fields in our features, and uh, we will embed those as integers. So we have uh, number of bedrooms, number of kitchens, number of fireplaces, 
number of half bathrooms, number of rooms, condition. Condition is a number that's scored between 1 and 10 that's assigned by an expert, um, presumably an appraiser or, or a real, realtor. Uh, we have the quality of the materials and the finish, again assigned by an expert, but it's a score between 1 and 10, and the number of cars that the garage can hold. So these are all small integers, typically between uh, 0 and 10, and we just embed them as, as they are. The kitchen quality is a, a field which is stored on a Likert scale. The kitchen is rated excellent, good, typical, fair, or poor, although I don't think there are actually any entries in the data set that receive a poor rating. And this is encoded as an integer between 1 and 5 after we embed it. Uh, the building type is a categorical field. This is embedded one hot. And so it's embedded as a five-dimensional vector, one of the canonical unit vectors with a one in one position and zero in all the other positions. Uh, the five different categories are single family, townhouse end unit, two family conversion, townhouse inside unit, and duplex. Um, there's also a neighborhood field. There are 25 different neighborhoods, so it's a categorical data field. And this is also one hot embedded. As a result, we have, looking back at our uh, fields here, we have 17 numerical fields, and we have uh, uh, the kitchen quality, which is 18, and then we have uh, 30 components, which are one hot. So the total dimension of our X data variable is 48. And we're going to add one more, which will be the constant. Now, when we do the standardization and the data splitting, we do this in a particular way. So we split the data randomly 80-20, 80% 80 for training and 20% for test. And that gives us an X0 training set and a corresponding Y train, and an X0 test set and a corresponding Y test. Um, now the way we do standardization is we use the training set to compute the means and the standard deviations of each of the features. So that means we'll get 48 numbers correspond to the means of each column of x0 train and 48 numbers correspond to the standard deviations of each column of x0 train. And now we can use the means and standard deviations to standardize x0 train um, simply by uh, subtracting off the means and dividing by the standard deviations. And we use the same means and standard deviations to standardize the test set. Now, in particular here, we don't want to use the test set to compute the means and the standard deviations because that would be including information from our test set into our predictor. Uh, there's also a particular uh, caveat that you should be aware of, and that is because the, so many of our variables are categorical, it, it often happens that particular columns of X train are actually all zeros. There's no data record, for example, that corresponds to a house in a particular neighborhood. Um, and that will give you a standard deviation of zero. And so if you try to apply the straightforward standardization, uh, then of course that will fail because we'll be trying to divide by zero. But that's very simple. All we do is we simply include that as a column of zeros in the data set. So after we've standardized both uh, the training and the test set using this these means and standard deviations, we can then apply, append a constant feature to both of them. And then we'll have X train and X test. And X train will be 1165 by 49, and X test will be 291 by 49.
So now we're going to do ridge regression. So we're going to uh, use the, remember the RMS log price as our performance metric. And so our loss will be the quadratic loss. We'll be minimizing the, me the empirical mean square error in the log price. And uh, uh, regularization, we'll use ridge regression, so we will use the quadratic regularizer. So remember how we do regularized empirical risk minimization. We choose a range of lambda values logarithmically spaced. Here we choose them between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the 3. And for each one of those lambdas, we solve the regularized empirical risk minimization problem to find a theta. We choose a theta, we find the theta that minimizes this quadratic function of the vector theta. Uh, notice that we've used a capital Y here, even though capital Y here is actually just a vector, not a matrix, because M is one. We've only got a single target variable. Um, and notice also that we're not regularizing the constant term in theta. Once we've got these uh, uh, theta values, I think we have 50 different lambda values, and so we get 50 corresponding theta values. Then uh, for each one of those theta values, we can compute the training error simply by computing the RMS of X train times theta minus Y train. That's just a vector. So uh, we take uh, uh, the one on N times the sum of the squares of that vector and then square root that quantity. And similarly, the test error, X test theta minus Y test. And for this data set, this is what we see. Here on the left, we have uh, uh, two curves uh, plotted against theta. We have the uh, empirical risk of the different thetas. So at any given lambda value, we have a corresponding theta. We have a corresponding test error and a corresponding train error. We can see that at all thetas, the test error is a lit does a little bit worse than the uh, uh, training and uh, uh, in fact regularization appears to offer no benefits here. The, the data is sufficiently, we have a sufficiently large amount of data compared to the number of features that we have that there's no danger of overfitting and uh, as a result the regularization does little for us. Um, the minimum RMS error is about 0.12, uh, which corresponds to about a 13% error in house price. Over here on the right, we have the plot of theta versus lambda, the regularization path. We can see that even with lambda about uh, uh, 0 0.1, we're starting to see some shrinkage the components of theta are getting smaller without any loss in performance. So a reasonable choice of lambda would be something of that order, somewhere between 0 0.1 and 1. Here we have the test data, and each point on this plot shows two values, the true price, y, this is of course the true log price, and the predicted log price, y hat. And ideally we would expect, we would want to have all points on the diagonal, indicating that we've predicted perfectly, and the points are clustered reasonably well about the diagonal. We're not doing badly. We have some outliers here and here, where we are vastly overestimating the price. And also here. 
but otherwise we're doing okay and perhaps one thing one might do after making these kind of predictions is to go back and look at those data records and figure out why the true price for those is so much less than the predicted price. We can also look at the, the theta. The entries of theta tell us something about the importance of the different features. And we can see that this one, this one, this one, and this one are important features, as is this one, this one, and this one. Those are the theta entries that have the largest magnitudes. They correspond to these seven features. Uh, four of those are about the size of the house, area of living space, area of first floor, area of second floor, area of basement. Very reasonable things that would drive the price of a house. Um, one of them is the year in which it was built, so how new is the house. And the other two are the experts' assessments of the condition and quality. And uh, so it's quite reasonable to see that these things show up as the most important determinants of the uh, price of a house. You can also notice that there are interesting points here. Um, the last 25 features in X are one hot encoding of the neighborhood. And if we look, for example, at this point and this point, there's a, this one's about 0 0.02 and this one's about minus 0 0.02. And that means that if I move from this neighborhood over here to this neighborhood over here, well then this first component here, the 31st, 32nd, 33rd component of X, switches from a 1 to a 0, and the 30th component of x switches from a 0 to 1, and so my contribution of theta transpose times x from those two components changes from minus 0 0.02 to plus 0 0.02, which means that the house price changed by about 4%. So just by moving from one neighborhood to another, we can see that much change in house price. And this, these last few entries of theta tell us which are the desirable neighborhoods and which are the undesirable neighborhoods. Okay, let's take a look at the code. Um, first of all, we can just run it and see uh, that it does what we think it should do. Uh, let's include the file is called house.jl and uh, the main function here is what we're going to run and that should do the computation and produce the plots. Every time you run it, it will produce slightly different plots because remember the test and train split is chosen randomly. Uh, we can see here this is just the raw data file. Uh, this is another piece of raw data. Here we can see, I think, these features. We can see what we've, what we've plotted here. Uh, no. So this code will be available on the website. Uh, there are two files, in particular house.jl, which does all the computation. And then there's another file called houseplots.jl. And uh, houseplots.jl does the plotting. That requires pyplot or you'll have to modify it to use whatever plotting package you are using. 
so here we're plotting two things. We're plotting the lot area and the living area. And so uh, versus price. And so here are our two features. This is uh, living area um, and this is lot area. And we can see that there's quite a few uh, really extremely large uh, houses which shift, which are really outliers in our data set. Uh, and so if we were to go through and uh, remove those or adjust for those in some way, we might find ourselves doing slightly better in our fits. One can open the data file in a spreadsheet and one can see the 1500 or so different records and the corresponding 80 or so different fields. Uh, if we look at the plots that were generated, this is our regularization path. That's, um, I don't need the plotting file anymore. This is our test and train errors as a function of lambda. And what's back there is our prediction versus true value. Let's take a look at how this works. Uh, so I have two windows on the screen. The one is my Julia terminal and the other is my editor containing the Julia code. This Julia code is about 150 lines long to do everything that we did today. Um, uh, the first thing it does is it loads the data. We can just take that and paste it into here. Now uh, that gives us two things. It gives us D, which is a matrix, which is an array of strings, 1456 rows by 81 columns. The 81 different fields, I guess the first field there is simply identify an identifier. So there's really 80 different um, fields and every entry in this matrix is a string and that's loaded by a function at the top of this file called load data which doesn't do anything very interesting it just calls the CSV library to load it. Yeah, it does one thing here which is it removes uh, what turns out to be a couple of outliers I think there were four of them which have um, uh, a living area greater than 4,000 square feet. And those are uh, uh, really quite extraordinary uh, houses in this data set. So we remove those. And then it just returns for us the data D and the header, which is a list of the field names. Now we can take N, it's the number of records we're going to have. Now we do two embeddings. One is Y, so embed Y. Let's take a look at that. What that does, this is the function definition here. It's a one line function definition. Um, uh, some things to notice. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a look at this. Uh, so get data field simply pulls out uh, that column of the data. So there's the prices. Um, let's just call that something new. Oops. There we go. And now string to number. These are all strings just from the way the CSV format is stored. So we can string to number it. Let's just call that U1. And now we've got an array of floating point numbers. Uh, one thing to notice about this, this is a feature of Julia that's worth being aware of, is the dot notation. So uh, string to number will happily take a string and return you back a number. But actually what U is, is not a string, it's, a, it's an array of strings or a list of strings. And so by using the dot notation, So if we were to call string to number on just U, it would say error. 
this you can't um, call the function that string to number calls, which is the parse function on an array, but you can um, do this. And what that does is it causes string to number to be applied to each entry of the array u, and it constructs an array of the results. So if I give it an, uh, an array of strings, it will happily give me back an array of numbers if I call it with the dot. And so we're just applying the string to number to each of the entries of that data record. Um, that's what u1 is. And then we're applying the log to each of the entries of that to get y. And so if I call embed y d header, it returns me back a vector, which is the log of all the prices. That's what y is. Uh, now we can uh, embed x. This is substantially more complicated because we've got a bunch of different fields. Uh, let's take a look at that. First of all, let's see what it does. That returns for us x, which is our 1456 by 48 array of the different fields that we have, 20 fields, some of which are encoded as one hot, and so they correspond to more than one column of this matrix. And all of our data records, all 1456 different houses. Now the way this works is that um, uh, in the embed x function here, this is the function definition, uh, we can see there's two convenient functions defined at the top. These are just for convenience. What they do is they're closures. They store the value of D and header so that whenever I call field name inside this function embed X, I don't need to supply D and header. Similarly, when I call real F name, that's just the same as calling string to number dot of get data field of D header name. So real F here stands for real field. And so what we're doing is we are, uh, we can define these functions in the Julia loop here on the left. And now if I do real F of year built, we can see what it's gonna do. It's gonna string to number the data field corresponding to year built, which is just a list of those numbers. And we can do, we do this for each one of these. And we get simply the list of the corresponding field numbers. Now we can also look at um, uh, some of the more complicated ones. One here that's more complicated is the uh, kitchen quality field. If we look at the, the kitchen quality field, that's a Likert scale. The entries in it are GD for good, TA for typical, um, excellent, and uh, uh, there may be uh, there are others. We can uh, unique that and see all of the unique entries in it. Good, typical, excellent, or fair. The unlikert function. Um, what that does is it maps these particular strings to numbers. Here it is. So unlikert sets up a dictionary which maps x to five, good to four, ta to three, fair to two, and poor to one, and returns the corresponding number. And so if I apply unlikert to that, I get a list of numbers. Notice the dot again, because I'm applying the unlike it function to each entry of the array separately and returning back an array of the results. Uh, there's one more little piece of 
conversion that goes on, and that's the one hot conversion. If I look at, say, the field building type, let's look at the smaller of the two, like that, again, is a list of strings, categories, five different possible categories. We can look at what they are by doing unique. There are the five categories. And the one hot here, one hot does not work entry-wise. One hot works on the entire list of 1456 strings. And it simply finds the categories, which are here are uh, unique. U, so we have U is equal to that. Unique of U is going to be the categories. And then it constructs a matrix, which is each row is a canonical unit vector, which is five dimensional, which is five is the number of categories. So we can see what it does if we do one hot of U. There's our one hot encoded building types. Here we have HCAT, which joins all of these columns together into one large matrix. And so that if I call embed X, I get the large matrix. Of all of our data. Now, test train rows and test rows are just lists of rows which are randomly selected. Uh, the split there is 80-20. When we call it, we'll get a new split. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, so train rows just says, well, you should use these particular rows as your training set and these particular rows as your test set. And there, that's all of the rows together, and that's a dis those are disjoint. Now what we do is we split up the feet, the, the data set, apply split does the um, does the the thing you might expect. Let's look at what apply split does. Apply split simply splits the data, picks out the corresponding rows for the train and the test set. Let me just run that, and now I've got an X train zero and an X test zero. My sets of features corresponding to the training and the test sets, and the corresponding Y's. Now the get statistics function gets the means and the standard deviations of each column very simply. So let's look at what that does. So now how many means have I got? I've got 48 means because X train zero, remember had 48 columns. And certainly I've got uh, 48 standard deviations. You can see there's quite a variation um, in their uh, means and in their standard deviations, which is why it's important to uh, standardize. Uh, standardize plus one convenience function that goes through and uh, does the standardization transformation on each column, divides, subtracts the mean, and divides by the standard deviation. Except in the case when the standard deviation is zero, which can happen, in which case we simply subtract the mean. And then it does one more thing after doing the standardization, which is it appends a column of ones. Of course, we can't do that before standardizing because that will just have its mean subtracted off. So if we do that to X train and X test, well, that gives us our true X train and X test from X train zero and X test zero. Now we're constructing lambdas, which is our list of lambdas. Note what we're doing here is dot to the power of, which means Again, it's a broadcasting call of the function, a call of the function power this time. So it applies 10 to the power of each of the elements of the range. So we have the range here, which is between uh, uh, minus three and three. That's a has a particular data type, which has a colon in it, it's a range. If you want to see it as a list, you can by doing collect, and there you'll see it as a list. Um, 
if I do lambdas to it, then I'll get my list of logarithmically spaced between 10 to the minus 3 and 10 to the 3 lambdas. Now we do ridge regression. We've seen that function before. This is applying it one by one to each of the lambdas. For each lambda in lambdas, call ridge regression to give me it, which returns a theta, and make a list of the thetas. That's what this notation means. This is called a list comprehension. If we run it, there we go, we've got a list of thetas. We can look at the size of the thetas variable, and it's just a 50-dimensional list. Thetas 1, the first entry, is a 49-dimensional vector, the same for all the others. It, it, each one of those is the theta corresponding to a lambda. Now for each one of those, we do another little for loop here, another list comprehension for each theta. We compute x train times theta, which is, remember, the prediction of y on the training set elements. And we compute the RMS error over all of the training elements. And the same for the test errors. So now we can do one more thing, which is find the minimum of the test errors. Here, this tells us that the 16th element of test errors was the smallest, and the corresponding test error is 0.122. We can also see what the corresponding theta is by looking at the corresponding entry of theta. We can see what the corresponding lambda is. There's the corresponding lambda. So we can just work out what those are right there. And everything else in is printing. We print our results. Print the optimal train, optimal test, the optimal lambda, and the optimal theta. Uh, and then there's a plotting, which we'll go through and make the plots that you saw. It needs all of these data elements to do that. And this is really how one would do everything that we've seen so far in the class to do with regression. We can create more complicated features for x. We could create, for example, uh, more one-hot features for instead of our... Uh, simple real number embedding of our ordinals. We could create product features and uh, we could pick out the outliers. Uh, and there's a few things we could do. Uh, in fact, for this data set, none of those things seems to make a great deal of difference, um, which is why we haven't done them. Now, we'll see other examples where we can do some of the more fancy things that uh, in, involve more fancy embeddings and more fancy regularizations.